Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, it's great to see you all. Uh, we're not decoding trends next door, but damn it, we're going to be better. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Sam Gill. Uh, I work at the Doris Duke Foundation, um, uh, which works to build a more creative, equitable, and sustainable future. And among our areas of investment, um, we, we have been big investors and promoters of, uh, of creative voices from the U.S. Muslim community trying to bridge divides through the prism of their experience. And uh, thank you. And uh, really delighted to be here with three uh, incredible uh, creative uh, visionaries, Iran Bilal, Iman Zuwari, and Ahmed Ahmed. Um, and the, we're going to be talking about censorship in a lot of different ways. Um, we'll talk a little bit about overt censorship, um, but I think we'll probably end up talking more about um, about covert forms of censorship, about ways that each of these creators and the people that they work with um, have felt pressure um, to include certain views or provide certain kinds of portrayals or to excise and remove certain kinds of views and, and portrayals. And I think our intention is for this just to be a conversation. Um, and maybe when we have about 15 minutes left, we'll open it up to questions. There's a microphone right in the middle of the in the middle of the floor there. Uh, so be thinking about what you might want to ask of these great uh, great panelists. Um, so I just wanted to start with a simple question: Should there be a ceasefire, and if so, under what conditions? No, we're not gonna we're not gonna start with that. Um, maybe 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 we'll get there inevitably. But um, I actually I, you know the, what I was thinking about how to start this conversation this morning. Um, I actually, I, I, I didn't want to start with the idea of censorship, which is the negation of something, because it's what makes censorship objectionable is the power of the thing that's being negated or the importance of the thing that's being negated. So I actually wanted to start by asking each of you about how you got in to the aspect of media and entertainment that you're in. What, what compelled you and, 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 and what is it that you wanted to say? at least when you entered this this industry. And so maybe, Iran, we can start with you. All right. Um, I have this on, but I don't know if it's... Is it on? Okay. Right. Salam, hi, namaste, uh, shalom. Um, so nice to be here. Um, I'm Pakistani, and it's um, at this point, you guys know that we're most of us are doctors, lawyers, and engineers, um, and uh, it is something you've heard. And I honestly, I just, I came to America to be an engineer, and I just, I grew up loving Bollywood. And I just felt that there didn't need to be one more in that spectrum. And uh, I've always wanted to be, actually, one of my first loves has been wanting to be a journalist and a reporter. Uh, I used to love Christiana Manpur and, like, growing up and watching that. And I just, you know, I think stories, like, um, like all of us, I, I think the idea of having, not seeing people like us. And uh, people thought Pakistan was in Iowa. This was pre-9-11. <laughs> I went to Caltech, and I have a very American accent. I just have an actor accent. So people thought I was American, and I was having from Pakistan. They're like, where is it, Iowa? Because I've never heard it must be in Iowa. So that's when I was like, okay, well, you know, at least 9-11 made people put Pakistan on the map, for better or for worse. But um, that's why. And, and how I got in, um, I don't take no for an answer. Uh -huh. nice. So we'll come back to that. Hey, man, how about you? How did you, how did you get into film? Um, so I was born and raised in Panama City, Florida. If anybody knows, it's... Uh, the panhandle of Florida, which is basically Alabama. And so um, I dealt with a lot of microaggressions and trauma, and I turned that into comedy, and that was really important to me. And like Iram, I am, uh, my parents are Egyptian, and my dad's the eldest of 17, and all of them are doctors in the medical field. So I was like the biggest loser of life. And so I was, my whole point, uh, I became very much of an American Muslim activist, and I really wanted to tell stories of um, Muslims. And, you know, what I saw on television and what was happening was not necessarily what me and my friends portrayed. So um, I'm one of the first hijabi American Muslim filmmakers, and I've made this, this huge goal to, like, tell our stories um, of just joy. And... Um, and like her, like like Iram, I love what you said. I'm gonna steal that. Take no, for, I'm not take no for an answer. But the way that I've had to do it is independently. So making my own stuff, um, supporting other Muslim filmmakers to make their own stuff with Islamic Scholarship Fund, that has been the biggest part of it. Is that because our stories need to be told um, without censorship and not let others tell it for us? Ahmed, how did you how did you get into this? Why did you get into this? Hi, my name is Ahmed Ahmed. Salam alaikum. Um, I was born in Egypt. My father immigrated to the U.S. when I was one month old. Um, just like the ladies here, doctor, lawyer, engineer, 
was the path, and that I had no interest in that. And uh, I just grew up watching sitcoms. I would go to the movie theaters every weekend and just sneak in from theater to theater. I was fascinated by film, filmmaking, stand-up comedy. When I was nine years old, I watched um, Eddie Murphy, Delirious, and that's what made me go, well, if he can do it, I can do it. <laughs> so um, fast forward, moved to Hollywood. I thought, oh, I'll do stand-up comedy later. I'm going to be an actor first. Um, so I was inspired by Robert De Niro, De Morgan Freeman, Denzel Washington, Jack Nicholson. And um, I got an agent. I went to acting classes in school. Um, I was always typecast as uh, terrorist number four in a lot of movies. Iron Man, Executive Decision, uh, The Cab Driver, The Sleazy Arab Guy. And I made a great living um, selling out, basically. And I was getting a lot of flack from my community, the Arab Muslim community. Uh, I called my agent one day and I said, hey, can I just audition for the friend, the doctor, the lawyer, like the normal person, the regular guy? And she said, no, uh, unless you change your name. And I said, well, what should I change my name to? She said, Rick. I said, oh, Rick Ahmed, like, that's gonna help. And uh, so I, I refused, I was hard headed. I said, I'm not gonna change my name. I said, call me if there are any roles that are mainstream, and the phone stopped ringing. I ran out of money, went broke, uh, slept on friends' couches, went back to waiting tables, and that's how I got into stand-up comedy. I was making my customers laugh. I worked at really shitty restaurants that served shitty food, but I was making the customers laugh, and I was making a lot in tips. And I thought, well, if I can make my customers laugh at restaurants, why can't I just do that on stage? So I just put the food aside, went straight to commerce, started grinding away at stand-up comedy, um, eventually got passed at um, all the comedy clubs in Los Angeles. Um, I was part of, co-founded and co-created a groundbreaking uh, comedy tour called the Axis of Evil Comedy Tour, which was a worldwide sort of phenomenon for myself and the other members. Um, it opened the doors for a lot of other up-and-coming Arab and Muslim comedians that are now famous. And um, that's kind of where I'm at now. And yes, ceasefire. <laughs> I, I, my dad came from India in the late 60s, also became an engineer, and then I studied the Dutch philosopher Spinoza. So if you want to be able to tell your parents there's something even less practical than film, it's studying the Dutch philosopher Spinoza. Um, but it worked. But we all got to this stage. Uh, and next we'll go to decoding trends. That's the stage we'll take over. Um, so I, I want to, Iram, you have a, a film out, you're screening it here, and you are. It's, it's a film that is about voice in a lot of ways, an expression, and you are making films and releasing them in an environment that is known yeah. for engaging in explicit repression. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, we'll come to the U.S. context, but can you talk a little bit about, first, what that, what that experience is like? What is it like to, to, to or how is the state engaged or not engaged? What kinds of pressures do you feel or not? And then maybe compare that a little bit to the experience of bringing the film to the, to the U.S. Yeah, I think that, you know, again, for better or for worse, there is enough information about Pakistan and, and all the so-called, what we, we, the issues we have with oppression and repression. What, but the thing is, in Pakistan, it's kind of known um, and we face it, it's out in the open. And I think here in the States, it's, uh, there's a lot of passive aggressive invisible censorship that happens on the green lighting level than on the distribution level. So wherever the microphone can be muffled or just you know everything be cut off even before it grows, that's where it happens. But going back to Pakistan, actually Pakistan really surprised me with Bakri. So we have a feature film that is a narrative spotlight. Here, please check it out. It's playing tomorrow Ooh. at Alamo Lamar, 715, shameless plug. Um, that's the other thing. Never take no for an answer and, you know, just be shameless in self-promotion. That's how you make it's it L. in film. Lamar, 715 Yes, tomorrow. that's what you do Get in there. film. Um, <laughs> but, you know, in Pakistan, Pakistan surprised us. Uh, they actually sensed, cleared a lot of the film. But, you know, it's all, it, things cannot be looked in microcosms. This is what, I mean, any sort of historical element happening, whether it's, you know, you know the war is happening, you cannot look at them in a, in a compartment. So, yes, censorship we, the film went through censorship, but there's been 50, 60, 70 years of just oppressing cinema. So now 
the cinemas are open, but the people don't go. The wings are cut off, like people just don't go, right? So now that's a problem. And how do you uncode? So it's like, okay, they're telling you you have a win, but wait a minute, what does this win mean to me anymore if the cinema culture is gone? And how did you, how have you reached audiences? Have you been able to reach I mean, audiences? it was digital, but like the, the muscle of cinema is gone. Like, so for example, for Pakistan, Bollywood is the reason why people go to cinemas. And because of India-Pakistan conflict, Bollywood is banned. And so the footfall doesn't come in cinemas. And the local industry has been sort of killed through, you know, sort of fascist, extremist ideas of, you know, films, in my opinion, being haram, uh, like not allowed and sinful over the years, you know, and different regimes have sort of uh, uh, maligned cinema. And so since the content creation wasn't happening, now you need the Bollywood supply chain so that the local industry can, you know, grow. But there's constant interruptions. So that infrastructure, the innate infrastructure, hasn't built enough to sustain that pipeline. So, I mean, it is a war that has to be fought on so many levels. But as filmmakers, then you just celebrate your wins, right? So for us, the win was not necessarily how many people came, but the fact that we have this very, very challenging, upfront, unapologetic film, in-your-face film, in theaters, across in 46 cinemas in a country that has 90-something cinemas. Mm. That's wow. a win, yeah. right? That's a win. It's a feminist, female-led film that talks about marginalized genders, and it's in theaters. So for me, that is how... And, and earlier what you were saying, part of how we deal with this is, like Iman said, you go through this, you try foolishly to go through the system, and you keep bumping your head on all the ceilings and the walls and the bubbles, and then what do you do? You do things independently. Because you refuse to be censored, because you're a storyteller, and your job is to tell stories, and they will resonate, and the ripples will get to your audience. You might not make money, and that's how they get you, by not trying to get you through the system. But I think that the fiercest of storytellers never stop. And what's the experience been in the U.S. as you started to screen the film? I mean, yesterday was our first North American screen. It was amazing. We have people here in the audience who saw it who were crying. And, you know, we had people who were clapping through the credits. Alhamdulillah. So, like, I don't know. We'll see. I, but again, foreign language film. You know, female. So, it's interesting. It's, so, I have stopped trying to decode the system, yeah. I only have energy to tell stories. And I believe in my audience. That's it. So it's like, I try and clear the fog and it's like, who do I do this for? And those are the people that energize me. That's it. Man, when you were making American-ish or, or uh, that's the project that comes to mind, but, but maybe there's another one you want to talk about. Did you, do you feel that you confronted, did you confront either express censorship, you know, notes coming from from some of the folks that you were working with, or did you feel tacit censorship? Yeah, for sure. So um, Americanish is um, it's a, a, an American Muslim rom com, one of the one of the few that have been out there. And I had taken it to a very close friend of mine that worked for Netflix, and I was wanting to pitch it to the independent, um, the under ten million dollar budget. And one thing that we were very fr- afraid of, it's a Pakistani um, American uh, Muslim story, was that it was too brown, and so. When they read it, um, and this is someone that's on my side, they were like, uh, there's, 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 it's too brown. <laughs> like, basically, like, you need to add more other people into it. And so that was actually pretty heartbreaking because it was from someone that was, like, on my team. And what I've noticed more, even when I'm pitching my other stories now, it's the same thing. It's like... Um, can they not be Egyptian-American? Maybe just don't put that they're Egyptian-American. Um, and I was like, well, but their mom speaks Arabic. Is that okay? And they're like, yeah, that's fine. And I'm like, but they're going to go to Egypt. Is that okay? They're like, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> so it's like these small things. And what we realize when I talk to my, my um, creative partner is that everyone is just scared. They want to tell our stories, but they're just scared. So I was also pitching a, a, a show to Warner Brothers, and they were like, we have a difficult time as execs to take this story up. And it's like, so it's not even like we keep saying over and over, we need people in the spaces to create these opportunities for us, the creatives. But even the execs are being censored by the people above them. And it's like, how far do we have to go to pull it through? And I was just talking to um, Isa Fatma, who I made um, Americanist with this morning, and I was like, you know, Isa, we, we, we are in from our one film, but it seems like we're still going to have to just do it independently because this is the roadblocks that we're constantly facing. What do you, uh, it's, I mean, your, your phrasing was very powerful about, you know, it was someone who was, who was, quote, on your side. Like, maybe one definition of privilege in a parochial context is that you just assume there's one side and you're on it and everyone else is. Mm-hmm. Do, do you, does, it, does it feel clear to you when you're 
either producing a project or you're supporting another filmmaker, um, that there are sides, you know, it could proverbial in the room, you know, Gosh. actually or conceptually, and w say more about what you think those sides are in any, in any given moment. That's a great question, Sam. Wow. Um, so yes, I never thought about that, about sides, right? Because we talk about it all the time, like, they're our ally. When we were like, hey, what, what, like, how do they feel about this? Like, oh, they're our ally. Particularly with the Palestine um, genocide that's happening now, it's like, oh, they're our ally. So they know what our story is going through. And so it's like, okay, when I'm about to pitch someone, I want to know, are they a woman of color? Are they a white male? Like, are they going to be re able to relate to the cultural specific story that I'm about to tell to where they want to see that story? So a thousand percent, I truly do believe that there's sides, but I love the idea of the fact that you're thinking like, can we be, live in a world where there's not sides, where we just see each other and all of our stories as a part of this fabric, which is America? And I hope that we can get to that point. Well, and you want to, I mean, I think it's, it's interesting, like, and I, you, you describe them with some sympathy, right? There, there are, it, it, it's a it's good news that there are executives who are working to rep these projects to advocate for these projects it's frustrating that their way of advocating is in some cases reinforcing mm -hmm. you know whatever the biases are they think they're well intentioned they are well intentioned and also as i listen to you it's challenging to be getting feedback and be suspicious about where that feedback is coming from, right? It, to, to not just to not be able to just say whether I agree or not. This is someone who believes in this project, who believes in what it's about, and this is their creative opinion. Right. And that's what's driving whether we should say the family. You know, it doesn't add to the story to say they're whatever, but that it you can't even have confidence about is this what they think? Is it coming from someone else? Is it what they think someone else is going to allow? You know, so. I think, I mean, it's just, it, there's a lot in the way that you describe that. And I, man, I want to go to you. I mean, you, your, your story, you know, is a really powerful, we've heard a lot about sort of the spectrum of explicit to sort of tacit censorship. You know, what you talked about is almost like internalized censorship. You know, <laughs> that your, your own conception of the story that you could be a part of and the role that you could play was set before you even got into the industry what was like your uh, what was your born again moment you know what was your what was your awakening when you that led you to say i'd rather sleep on a friend's couch than be terrorist number 4 what was what what happened did, some, did was there a thing that happened or was it a gradual process yeah well when my agent said you need to change your name and i just i was like no my name is ahmed ahmed and what's the difference between being named ahmed or rick like my aha moment was I grew up in America, I speak English. If I didn't tell you I was, you know, Egyptian or Muslim, you wouldn't know, you would think I was Puerto Rican, you know what I mean? And so my aha moment was like, you know, I'm better than that. I don't want to keep playing. It was literally the same role over and over. I'd go into the casting office, there was all, all these, you know, brown people, we all looked alike. You can hear everybody in the audition room behind the closed doors, la 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 la, you know? <laughs> I'll kill you in the name of Allah. It's just like, how many times are you going to kill somebody in the name of Allah, right? <laughs> it just got too much. I was like, I remember I, I auditioned for this movie called Executive Decision with yes. Kurt Russell and Steven Seagal. <laughs> you like that movie? <laughs> and uh, I think that was Passenger 57. But uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Harrison Ford. But yeah, but same, same thing. And I remember um, I was, I was, I was, struggling with auditioning for these parts. And my agent called me at one point. She said, there's a big blockbuster $70 million action movie with Kurt Russell. And I know you don't want to do this, but um, um, it takes place on an airplane that's being hijacked by a bunch of uh, Arab Muslims. Huh? The guy who played Thank you, counselor. Um, <laughs> and... She says, she goes, just, just go in and read. So I said, all right. I went in and I read. And I just wanted to mock the audition. I wanted to make fun of it just to show the absurdity of it all. Yeah. My lines were something like, sit down, you will obey, or I'll kill you in the name of Allah. You know, I just overdid it. And the director was like, brilliant. It's like American fiction. That's exactly what we want. Uh, yes. He's like, but can you do it again? But this time, give me a little bit more of that... Uh, you know, that Arab Middle Eastern. Uh, 
I said, anger? He goes, yes. <laughs> Use that hidden Middle Eastern anger your people possess. Uh-huh. So I was like, all right. So I used it, and I got the part. My agent called me the next day. She said, you booked it. I was like, I was joking around. I wasn't even, like, I was trying right. to make fun of it. She goes, whatever you did, it worked, and they want to put you in this movie. And I said, look, tell them I said thanks, but no thanks. I'm just perpetuating stereotypes. I'm, I'm feeding the beast. I'm putting fuel on the flame. No thank you. Wow. What did your, but, what did your agent but say? But she said they want to pay you $50,000 for two weeks of work. So I was like, la, 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 la. You know, <laughs> I, I, I'm doing I, this under protest. In the so, name of Allah. Um, so I, I, I begrudgingly took the role because, A, I was an out-of-work actor, yeah. and I was sleeping on couches, and I just didn't want to wait tables anymore. B, I took it because if I didn't take it, they were going to give it to a Mexican guy or somebody else that was just yeah. brown. And, and the other thing was, um, you know, and, and now looking back on it, like, if somebody called me and said... I was in the movie Iron Man. I, I basically played the same role in Iron Man 12 years later. And the way I justified it was, you can't get mad at an actor from a certain culture playing a bad guy of, of that culture. It's called acting. Like, you don't get mad at Robert De Niro for playing an Italian mobster. You don't get mad at Jack Nicholson for playing an Irish mobster. You know, you can't get mad at a person of color playing a bad guy um, in a movie that's either based on a true story. Like, if you're going to cast that actor from that race, then cast that actor well, from yeah, that's, that race. That's, that's a question I want to ask all of you. Like, is, is what's the bigger problem here? Is the bigger problem here that, that an Arab-American actor can only get this kind of role? Or is the bigger problem that there's this contemporary form of Orientalism that these are the roles? Like, is well, the bigger problem that these movies are being... I mean, even Air Force One, it was like... They were, so, they were Chechnyans or Chechnyan-like. Like, they're just sort of reaching for some kind of swarthy race. And then Gary Oldman plays the But, I mean... But we're not even getting... So, like, we're not even getting cast to play... Like, this movie Dune that just came out, Dune yeah. 2, it was based on um, Arab Muslims. Mm-hmm. And all the actors are white. Mm-hmm. Look, look at... Um, I mean, I can name a, a, a dozen movies where, where all the actors that were supposed to be Arab, you know, Muslim or, yeah. or Middle Eastern Muslim... We're, um, we're white. And the reason why is yeah. because a white person is telling the story. Yeah. That would not be the problem if we were telling the stories and then we were being uplifted to tell the stories that we weren't being able to have to constantly be gate kept by everyone. So like for you, it's who's making executive decision, yeah. who's making passenger. What about you, Iram? I actually, I'm going to be a little meta on this. I think that the bigger issue is generational dehumanization. I feel that we exist, sure, a white person's making a movie, but I feel like a white person who's grown up around people of color could be a lot more informed or be more willing to sort of call that said friend and be like, hey, you want to direct this movie? I think the issue is that even if we're making content, there's this presumption that if I'm making brown content, only brown people will watch it. Only brown people can see themselves up on screen. Well, we grew up watching white people's stories and we humanized with them. So the problem is empathy is broken. And when empathy is broken... And I don't want to look at your story and I don't want to identify in you because I'm only seeing the color of your skin. And, I, and with all respect to DEI and inclusion, it's problematic what you were saying earlier. It's well meant maybe, but it's problematic. Because now, literally, I go to Pakistan and, 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 and parties and I'm like, I'm, an, I'm a woman of color director. And people are like, wow, America is effed up. Like, what, what are you, how are you describing yourself? But Hollywood does this. I did not know I was a Muslim woman of color director I, in my days at Caltech. And I was very like, this is Hollywood, right? So now I'm getting the calls. Why, it, it's like, oh, why can I only be called for a film that has a Pakistani tent yeah. on it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You see my craft. Mm-hmm. I've even gotten people telling me, because it's a foreign language film, they're like, oh, when you make an English film, we'll get an agent. You know, an agent. And I'm like, but you see me speaking English, and I can direct. Can you not connect the dots? So I also, I do want to say censorship is not just on the level of the execs and then the decision makers. Censorship is the critics, who choose to not, you know, this is a big issue too. Like there's not enough people of color, because of what I'm saying, they don't see enough international films or films of certain content. So there's a certain demographic of critics who do not connect with that film. So what happens? You make a film, they, they slash your film in the biggest trades, the sales agent won't call you, no one will distribute you. So this is a systemic issue where it's like, yes, when you say what's the problem, to me the problem is in our streets. 
you know, our main streets and our, and, and our homes and our neighborhoods, are we talking to our neighbor? What do you think? I mean, so, so a bunch of the people who are at South by Southwest, um, who, you know, this is one of the only places that really brings entertainment together with technology. And the technology folks would say, we agree with everything that we, we've heard. The problem is all these gatekeepers. The critics are gatekeepers, the studios are gatekeepers, the distributors are gatekeepers, and our tools that we have now you know, introduced to the world, they're now 20 years old, these tools let you go around the gatekeepers. Now everybody can be a critic. Now everyone can distribute their own film. Now everyone can, what do you, has, has the era of social media, you mentioned you know, the, the digital as an opportunity, has, has the era of social media helped? Has it displaced the legacy gatekeepers? Has it hurt? Has it created new gatekeepers or, 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 or created new pathways for tacit censorship and bias? Is it some of both? Like, I, 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 th that, that's certainly their gospel, yeah. you know, that, they, that everything you're talking about is exactly the problem that they think they, 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 they're here to solve. If, um, if I can just yeah, please. rewind for a second to go back um, to what Iman was saying. It really, it's, it's, you can't wait for Hollywood to tell our story because they don't know our stories. Yeah. So we have to do it internally. We have to reach out to the Muslim, Arab, Pakistani, Middle Eastern community, find the people that have deep pockets that are interested in uh, investing and funding in our, our stories. It's really up to us. As much as I say we, we, we you know, we can't really blame the system. We can't blame Hollywood. And to, to coattail your um, social media and sort of media, you know, tech side of things. That's the beauty of it. Is now it's like it's an all Western shootout. You don't you don't even need agents these days. A lot of these. Have people, you been able to succeed using? Oh yeah, I haven't I haven't had an agent in ten years, and I've been just self sufficient. You know, I do the work. I get up every morning. I roll probably fifty, a hundred phone calls and emails a day. A lot of people say no. A lot of people don't answer. But one, two, three, or four, or five people do, and those are the people that you know make the difference, and they're moving the needle. Um, but it is really up to our community to, when I say invest, like literally invest. And you know, a lot of these people in our community have money, but they're afraid to take a risk and a gamble on the arts because there is no guaranteed return on investment. Just like what you were saying with yeah, distribution yeah. and all that. But, but Emmett, I'm going to, and as, and as, as an indie warrior, and I have a lot of repeat supporters who have invested in my film, my first feature 13 years ago, I've been in the trenches for 17 years doing exactly what you're saying, shaking those pockets. Some of those pockets are in the room today. But it's unfair. Agents do matter. You are an artist. You're a storyteller. I know so many people who are repped who are not spending their energy and their time doing that. They're sitting there in their cozy couch writing a script that's paying them $50,000. I know we all have those tools. So it is a little bit of all. And like, I mean, we can sit here and argue about how unfair that is. That is our reality. But if we're talking about, like, systemic change is happening. And sure, we're doing grassroots, top-down, bottom-down approach. But Agents are important. Let's let's. I know you and I. Is, we are all indie. Right, well, this well, is whether I, whether you make it about social media distribution. Or I, the nub of the question, right, is a, a, a critical theme in, that you guys have all articulated on stage is, you know, relative access to financing. Yes. To to make to distribute to just sustain yourself as an individual is one of the critical determinants of whether your voice is heard or not, and therefore one of the critical determinant is, and therefore a force for censorship or not. And, and one form of censorship is to not finance a voice, a story, an idea. And another form of censorship is just to only finance other things that then take up the, the totality of the media ecosystem. So I, what the argument that the technology companies here would make is we think that if we create alternative channels for you to produce and distribute, the money will flow to you. What, what's, what's our theory? That's a theory. Like, Iman, what is, what's your theory about how you're going to be able to finance the work that you want to make and that you and and that the 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 the, the creators that you support are going to be able to build um to, to be able to to develop work and to make sure that it reaches audiences yeah i mean and i think it's it goes off both what iram and ahmed are saying so for american-ish um we only pitched american muslims and uk muslims and i'm proud to say it's a hundred percent funded by um, America, or U.S. Muslims and um, U.K. Muslims, and 90% of them were female. And so that was really important to us because of the censorship of, like, I don't think these other people are going to fund this because they don't know our story, even though 
brown people don't fund the arts, so it was challenging. Um, but I want to I want to take it, and so I think that it's really important. And what most uh, minority communities have done is they have used their own people to build up. And once they show that they build up, then it's like, okay, we're going to tell these stories. The other thing too is all Hollywood cares about is money at the end of the day. So John Chu, um, you know, he made Crazy Rich Asians, and he said the only way that he was able to make it was to show Hollywood how glamorous and rich Asia Asia was, and. Everyone showed up for that film, and they were like, okay, this is making money, let's do it again. Same thing with Girls Trip, right? Um, Black-led uh, comedy. That brought in money. They're like, okay, they can bring money. Um, a Woman King from Viola Davis, and who doesn't love Viola Davis? She's the queen. She was asking people on her social media, hey, guys, please go watch this movie because we have to prove to Hollywood that black female stories are important. Viola Davis said that, right? And it's so it keeps going from point to point in terms of, how we can build and support ourselves, and I completely agree because we are so grassroots that it has to start with with us and our communities and people pulling us pulling us up and the allies. But I do want to mention the social media aspect. So social media in terms of film and Hollywood, not much. Like you don't see many shows that come out. I know that Powder Keg did a great show with Kosar Mohammed that that came out, but I don't know in terms of like a revenue stream if it really helped. But what social media really has done for us particularly for Palestine, is it told the story of what's tr what, what truly is happening. It created the Arab Spring. It, it finally got um, people that were supporting Zionism to see that genocide is happening. So social media has really changed, and then those stories are told from that, right? So it's all part of a narrative that goes through, and I think that social media creates a very strong narrative. Yeah. Can I? Let's go I'm sorry, go, ahead. And then, go ahead. I was just going to say, I was going to say back to your social media comment. There is no denial about the positive impacts of social media, right? It's democratizing, but there's also a lot of noise that it creates, right? So, yes, it does give us opportunity, but the Achilles heel is monetization. And just like Iman said, when you can't monetize, so therein lies privilege. Yeah, right? see, that's like, my like, sense. My sense is it can help you, it can help some people to access the legacy forms of financing and distribution. Exactly. But it's not really a plausible It's not plausible. And this idea when people say, oh, you know, we can build these tools and then like, I mean, and I, I also have a family that works in AI and I have these arguments with it all, all the time. It's like, yeah, by the time this uh, is all going to like settle down and AI is going to be creating all these jobs and it's like, my career will be over <coughs> because initially like, you know, maybe a robot's going to be writing screenplays and I'm going to be asked to go humanize that, you know, text. We, we have to see where that falls. But... These platforms, in, the more they democratize, um, I feel like we start fighting for pennies like in, yeah. on the bottom rung. And the privileged are continuing to get their access and continue to make money and continuing to get more time and resources to make bigger and bigger stories. And then everyone's like clapping. Oh, look. And sometimes not making money, but still getting not, hired. Yes. And, you know, I yeah. you wanted to. I just wanted to go back to the agent thing. Yeah. The reason why I haven't had an agent in so many years was because... In 2015, I um, participated in the first ever Palestinian comedy festival with a guy named Amr Zahir. And um, he's an activist, he's a scholar, he's a lawyer, he's also a, a comedian. And we brought stand-up comedy to, to Palestine. It was my first time witnessing and, and experiencing being a part of the open-air prison, the checkpoints, all that stuff. When I was leaving Tel Aviv airport, I was highly interrogated for 12 hours, strip-searched, the whole thing. It was... It was, it was incredibly and psychologically painful. When I finally barely made my flight, I, I did a Facebook post about how the Israeli Defense Force, it was, it was, it was humiliating the way I was treated. The, the government is out of line, and I was very outspoken about it on Facebook. When I landed at my next destination, I had dozens and dozens of messages from all my Jewish friends, colleagues, agents, managers, casting people, producers in Hollywood saying, you're anti-Semitic, how dare you, why do you hate Jews, what's your problem, I've known you 25 years, what's gotten into you, this, that, and the other thing. One by one, my agent dropped me, my manager dropped me, my lawyer stopped working with me. I was technically blackballed and blacklisted from Hollywood. And so that's, that's why I'm saying I took it into my own hands because people just didn't want to work with me. They were like, oh, well, this guy hates Jews. Well, guess what? Hollywood is run by Jews. And if they don't like you, word gets around and you're unliked. So, and it's funny, fast forward now, now if I speak about the IDF, it's okay. It was like I was ahead of my time. 
You know what I'm saying? So, so to go back to the agent yeah. thing, I, I literally just signed up with a management company two weeks ago. Yeah. I still don't have an agent. I'm all for power. I'm just Neither saying, do I. Well, I'm but just I'm just saying, but, but just to get back, but just shocked. to get back, just, uh, just, Same to, here. just yeah. to kind of uh, just to finalize my thought. That's censorship. When we talk about censorship, yeah. okay, I can't even be outspoken about how I was personally treated at the airport by the Israeli Defense Force. And so because I spoke out about it on Facebook, I was... I was censored. I got shut down, just like that. Within a couple days, I was dropped by everybody. And I was on a TV series at the time. I was uh, touring all over the world. I was at the top of my career. And, and one, one Facebook post uh, canceled me. And For so and it took truth. me, it's taken yeah. me 10 years to re- rebuild and grow and reinvent and, you know, try to have a voice again. And, and you know, alhamdulillah, thank God, I'm getting there, but it was it's, it's been an uphill battle. Does, what is what is um, look? I was going to ask a question um, about you know this moment in comparison to post 9/11, but then I thought like that's a stupid question. Like the real question is where do we want to be, not measuring ourselves by these various low low water marks. Um, so I, I want to before opening up to the audience, like I want to ask a version of that. Like where do we what is success to you? Is is each of you is success access to to mainstream um, networks and opportunities? Is it the ability to reach a different audience? Is it both? Number one, and then number two is, you know, are there are there green shoots? Are there things that you see that are promising and that can help point the way to what you see as success for yourself. Maybe we'll start with you, a man, and then and then Iram, and then Ahmed. Yeah. So to me, success is having hundreds of Muslim filmmakers from every ethnic group telling thousands of Rami type of stories. That to me is success, and to for our communities to build us up and to support it. Not just Muslim communities. I'm talking about our American community and our Hollywood community. That to me is success. Um, and then not to be, you know, like, you know, everybody's dream and I'm sure everybody's dream. I just want to be called up and be like, Hey man, can you direct this thing? You know, like that, it would be really awesome in terms of success. But I always try to look for future generations and, you know, everyone on the stage here, we're like firsts and it's always like the first have it the roughest. I'll never forget Stacy um, Spikes who runs um, Urban World and Created Movie Pass. He was like, you have, you're breaking down the glass wall as a first and you have arrows on your back. And I'm like, but I don't want arrows on my back, <laughs> right? It, but that's the thing. It's like, you, we create this so that others can have it and we create more opportunities for others so we have a better unity, community, and peaceful um, world for everyone. And what, do you see any signs of hope in your experience? Even if they're tiny, tiny little <laughs> little green shoots coming out of the, the turf? Be positive. Yeah. Sue is always like, Iman, hey where's the hope? Um, so, yes, I mean, I guess it's true. Like, my film, you know, it it, it, it got distributed by Sony. Um, also, shameless plug, please watch it, VOD, American-ish. Um, it's really important to, to, to watch. So, like, those things that it came out, the fact that um, we are here on stage yeah. and telling this story is huge. The fact that we're supporting MPAC, ISF, CAM, all these to tell Muslim stories, that is hope that Doris Duke is providing. You know, all of these small things are huge, and all of us are from the same generation. It's like this, I would have never, ever thought this would happen in 15 years. And so that is huge progress. And if it's going to be the way it is now, like in five years, it's going to be, t- you know, 100 times better. So How did there you is prevail hope. with Sony? What was key, do you think? Why, why them and no one else? Okay, so great question. It's all about who you know, right? So my EP, he is a huge um, producer for Sony. So he did like Scream and Expendables. He saw my film. He's like, wow, this is telling stories about um, American Muslims I've never seen. Uh, let me call my Sony friend. Call my Sony friend. He's, he's like, you need to distribute this. And they're like, okay. That's literally how it went. And so it's really, again, like who you know that's going to pull through and that who's going to um, advocate for you. And that's why I think it's incredibly important, and that's, I feel like, my biggest role in life is to be an advocate for others. Because if you don't have an advocate, then you're going to be um, put to the ground. And also, it's not about talent, and I'm sure everybody knows this. It's like, there's thousands of people that are incredibly talented. It's not about talent. It's about who you know and who's going to uplift you to put you in It's not about talent. I'm in the wrong (laughs) business. I should be in Hollywood. (laughs) Iram, what's a success for you, and do you see any signs of hope? Um, Success for me is... um, when conversation and communication don't break down. 
Um, I think genuine curiosity in humanizing the so-called other in your present. I think that when we can start listening to each other and stop talking past each other, and I mean this in a global context of like politics, news, media, everything, that has to happen and that is terrifying because I feel like it's just getting very bad very fast. But the positive, so that to me, and that would help and trickle down on storytelling. Yeah. And I think because if you can't be curious and learn how to humanize the other, then you just don't care about the, anything. No. You don't even care about their life. How are you going to care about the stories? No. If you can just kill without feeling, do you really think you're going to get up and go watch a movie about somebody? We're really so on the bottom of that totem pole. So in this current world, to me, that's success. Um, I think the positives are obviously I look at the generations coming up and I see that they are, you know, it's like, like you were saying about the, the arrows comment. It's like, people are like, oh, you're a pioneer. And I'm like, yeah, but pioneers are forgotten, you know. Exactly. <laughs> but that's fine. You some, know, it's really, some, many are remembered in your I, know, I, I know, I mean, but you don't, when you're a pioneer <laughs> or you're fortunate enough to be one of the first in line, you're not doing it because yeah. you want to be remembered. You're sure. doing it because you're clearing the wear. You're clearing sure. the thorns, right? So I think that when I do look around me and, you know, I, I run a screenwriting program for Pakistan and I look at these screenwriters and I look at the stories they're telling and how the world cinema lens is finally like, oh, Pakistan has stories too now. I'm happy. That's positive. I'm so, so grateful for Doris Duke and MPAC. You guys are shining a light on us, right? So I think that is positive. And maybe, maybe, I, I think it's, it's in numbers. And I think that, one more thing, I think if all of us can learn to just pull more up as we go up, that'll be success for us. Because before we know it, the room will be full. And we'll break down the doors. And we'll go to Ahmed. If you have a question, you should, there's the mics in the middle of the room and you should line up. Otherwise, I'll just keep asking questions. Uh, before I forget, I just want to thank um, MPAC, Doris Duke Foundation, Sue Obedi, who works relentlessly and tirelessly. Like, she's yes. on the yeah. spot. So yes. give it up. Yeah. And, uh, and her partner, Elise, Elise Walker. I don't is know Elise, if you're in the house, Elise, Elise but give it up for Elise. Yeah. So what's, what's um, success for you, and do you see any hope? Success for me is just bringing laughter to the world. I think that's one of the most important things. There's a, there's a couple common denominators that everybody loves, food, uh, music, and comedy, laughter. Who doesn't like to laugh? And so for me, when I'm doing a, a comedy show anywhere around the world, whether it's in front of Arabs, Muslims, white people, Latino, black, whatever... Laughter really does make the world go round and round. Yeah. And the, the, the most thing, the, the thing that inspires me and gives me the most gratification is when somebody in the audience is laughing so hard, they start crying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I've had, and yes, I'm, I'm that good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I've literally... My sister made, does that all the time. I've I'm literally made people like cry and I'll say to the person, are, are you crying? And they'll be like, yeah, I'm like, that's great. Yeah. But did you pee a little bit? That's because. Uh, <laughs> and I really know I got it. <laughs> if you're extracting bodily fluids from people, <laughs> then you did your job. That's better than an Oscar. Yeah. So for me to answer your question, what is success? To bring laughter to the whole planet, yeah. and we all just need to just have a good, just a good old laugh together. And what si any signs of hope to you, or progress? I mean, I hope. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just you know. I look at myself like a, it's a craft, it's a trade, I'm like a carpenter. You know, I go to work every day, I cut wood, and, you know, hopefully, you know, we build this house of laughter. Laughter is, comedy is the last, um, you know, existing art form of, of freedom of speech, you know? And if you can have that and bring a little humor into it, um, I think it's important. I think it also heals people. Yeah. People literally, I've... You know, there's stories of people laughing cancer out of their bodies. Yeah. So I think laughter is, is, for me, bringing laughter to the world is success for me. Let's, uh, looks like we've got some questions. So just a quick reminder, we're only taking questions that end in a question mark. Um, so go for it. Maybe just say who you are, if you would. Uh, my name, is the mic on? Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Mustafa. I work in tech policy for the federal government. So my only purview of Hollywood is really recent tensions of 
uh, with AI and, and, and various folks in the industry. Uh, my question is, uh, given that there is this concern uh, about AI and jobs in Hollywood, how, how, does, how do you all feel about the impact of AI when it comes to minority voices? Because in my mind, you know, AI is used to, is, is using existing content to create new content. But given that there isn't that much Muslim American content in Hollywood, do you think that uh, there would be more desire for minority voices given that AI can't be used to replicate them? Wait, so are you, is your question that it, is AI going to help Muslim American stories? Well, it's more, uh, how do you think AI will impact minority voices, like Muslim voices? I'm just putting a positive spin to it, but oh, okay. curious what you guys think. I mean, I think it's a concern because AI takes what's out in the internet already, yeah. so all it's doing is going to perpetuate the stereotypes that are already there. Yeah. But what I also realized, and I didn't know from before, because I think that AI, there's a positive thing in AI in terms that it can definitely help in so many different ways, but I didn't know, like, I don't know if you know this, you put your script in AI and you're like, give me the themes of my script, it's going to take the script to use it for other things. Yep. And I didn't know that, so everybody be careful with that. Um, right. And so I guess if a bunch of filmmakers are doing that, then they'll take more positive um, aspects of AI. So there's, there are positive aspects of AI, but they should not be taking away from the stories. But again, it should, in my opinion personally, it should be coming from the, do, the story. Do you think, I feel like the AIs are going to leave auditions being like, they just want to cast me as an evil computer that tries to nuke <laughs> the world. This sucks. Um, <laughs> I, my personal opinion is that I understand that there's a positive spin about creating jobs, but being somebody who's been in Hollywood and seen the systemic isms, I think a lot of people are going to lose a lot of jobs and generations of filmmakers are going to be, you know. I mean, there's literally a demonstration already of like however many seasons of South Park. Did you see that? No. They like decoded the voices and recreated and scripted so many. So you can imagine. So, so the upper echelon will get the... The sh the, you know, get to like put their sprinkles on it, but what about the entry points? Right, that's the right. It will be robotic, so right. the pipelines are going to cut. Mm. Right, the Occam's razor is going to be only prestige projects even have so writers' what do you rooms think? and stuff. So, like what that. do you think? Yeah. Marginalized people, where exactly. do you think they're going to go? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, that's my response to AI. Well, fortunately for stand up comics, <laughs> AI can't do what we do. You can't, <laughs> it's just impossible. Fa this, I'm worried a recording of that is going to be get played over and over. <laughs> I'm like, Death of the comic, question mark? You know? yeah. <laughs> so. But specifically, I think writers and actors, in my opinion, that's harder. Like, yeah. those jobs are really tough right now. With like, But I think like also, like, directors, right? So being asked yeah. to, like, direct. It's, it's the more, like, uh, Jack Ma said this, I think, like, at the World Economic Forum five, six years ago, and I loved it, because he was saying, teach your kids to be artists, because he knew what was coming. Teach them, because uh -huh. creativity, imagination cannot be roboticized. That's true. All right, next question. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Assalamu uh, alaikum. My name is uh, Ismail. I am actually the editor in chief of my school newspaper at the University of North Texas. All nice. Right. Uh, Thanks for coming. My, my question is uh, you guys talked a lot about how it's up to our community to bankroll and like fund our projects and represent our voices in media. But I was wondering, do you guys also think that um, the ones who have made it, like the Muslims who have made it, like uh, I know you mentioned Rami, Hassan Minhaj, uh, Muhammad Amer with his new Netflix show, do you think they have also like a role in like pushing those voices up because they like, like you said, broke the glass ceiling and like, do you think they could be doing maybe a little bit more or do you think, have you seen them um, like be, push those voices up? Like, do you think those, like, that have made it, like, have a bigger role to play? Thanks for your question. All those three names you just mentioned used to be my opening acts. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy and proud to see them flourish, but no, they're not, they're not uh, bringing people up with them like they should be. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Thanks. And do they have a responsibility to do that? Yes. yes. I think everybody does. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you Thank for you. your question. Thank you. All right, salam alaikum. Uh, good afternoon. Hello. Uh, Wajahat, I drive a minivan. Uh, <laughs> Can we just give a round of applause to this gentleman, Wajahat no. Ali? Yeah. He, talking about people who are up there and representing us, I adore you and respect you, and thank you for coming to our panel. I will Venmo you. Um, <laughs> very, very, qu very quickly, uh, tomorrow's the Academy Awards. There's a movie that's nominated called Past Lives, which is mostly in Korean, Parasite one best picture, so it seems there's expansion when it comes to really understanding and appreciating diversity. But we're in this moment right now where, speaking about censorship, uh, I know talent, 
across the field that is saying, all right, strategically, people of color, Muslims and Arabs, we have to either stay quiet until this situation resolves itself in Gaza, but 30,000 people have been killed, self-censorship, and then on the meta level, we know people who have lost their jobs, like Melissa Barrera, the lead star of Scream, right. who reposted uh, something up, you know, she reposted a Jewish American scholar's article on genocide. She lost the Scream role, which was a lucrative, you know, moneymaker for uh, Dimension Films, and we're like, man, if Melissa Barrera is, is gone, what about us? So when it comes to censorship, for what's your advice to many creatives at this moment who are like, how do I navigate this moment but I still feel like I have to speak out, and also to young artists who are looking at you and us and saying, you're telling us that things have changed, and I'm seeing people like you get fired, F the entire system, burn it all down. Yeah. Great question. And congratulations on Thank all your successes. You. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you want to take it? You go ahead. Um, well, I actually think that both those, I think that burn it all down has to happen. Um, and also to answer your question, I think each to their own. I think everybody needs to sort of be comfortable in their truth and how much they want to express truth. You, it's not one, one size fits all. So my, to those young ones, I would say if you, because there is a balance, and I was talking to a family member earlier today who's very much on the top of a tech company, there's the strategic people, and then there's the people who need to wear their kifias and protest on the streets. And you need all forms of resistance at every level to not be shut out. So that is my response to that. And your first question was something else. What was your first question? Self-sufficiency? Self-censorship. Self like during this moment. No, I, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I think each to their own. So I'm going to say Aram has the right answer. But I'm going to say never censor yourself. Always be true to your voice. And something will always come to you later. But I am the one of the ones that are the radicals that are st standing out there <laughs> and putting the, thing, the fist in the air. Yeah. But... Aram's answer is the right answer. <laughs> I think it's also, it's, it's yeah. you know, like in the question I hear too, it's, on, on the one hand, I, the, the thing, we, time after time, the thing that makes a, the American media, eco, that it makes American culture so dynamic is that there's space for fractiousness and rancorousness, that there's, there's always more than one person saying the thing no one else will say, and that's the thing that makes our culture so vibrant. The problem is, it's really hard to be that person, as you've, as you've all pointed out, and not every version of that person succeeds. Right. And so, so in a way, it's a kind of, it's a tax on marginalized identities and cultures that all of the entertainment industry benefits from. That's true. Um, and so I think like a, a challenge, it seems to me, out of that question is, how, what is the responsibility of those who, who of, 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 the, of the, the significant sources of institutional capital within this industry to pay that tax and to recognize that like there is no there is no american culture without people taking really big risks in what they say and what and they I do and i sorry i remember now what i was going to say sure she lost her job for scream but then five people walked off the project and the project is, is in delirium now so what does that do right and also you know i was protesting with her at sundance she still is speaking out for it cuz so so she was like forget you i'm still going to talk about it which is super amazing so it, it creates more of stand up for what you want of what what is right and what is true and there will be people that support you like Aram said so i think the people in the streets have always led the people in the suites yeah, exactly. That's a way better. That's a much better way of saying Always. it. Always. And it, and weirdly, it, the people in the suites kind of know that, but then yeah. they forget. They forget that the the real street is the one that's always challenging what they're thinking. And the question is, can we, can there be people? We can we can work around the suites, but can there be people in the suites saying, if you fire her, we're going to hire her the next day. That's yes. our opportunity to yeah. be out on the on the cutting, mm -hmm. on the cutting edge. All right, I think we got time for one or two more questions. I'm Zoreen Shah. My car is way nicer than Wajahid's. Uh, I promise most of my questions will end in, in a question mark. Um, I, my first question is, are there any agents in the room? <laughs> Does anyone know an agent? I think these four, these three would be really happy if you texted them and said you saw them at South by Southwest and they were phenomenal. Thank you, you guys for are. that. Thank so. you. Thank Advocacy. You. Thank you. Um, so my question is, uh, Aram, I think you hit the nail on the head when you talked about um, critics and you know, the discussion about gatekeepers. I think we have a couple of South Asians and Muslims now 
um, I don't know about Muslims actually, I'm not sure, who are agents. Um, I haven't agents. seen yeah. any critics, any mainstream big critics. How do we create the foundation to support people to become and put them in those roles? If anyone here is unemployed, uh, there's a great need for you to, to pursue that, but what are your ideas? How do we foster that, the next generation of critics who look like us? I'm just quick. I don't want to. I could. I, I have a habit of talking too much, so you can tell me to shut up. Uh, I you can't can tell anyone on the censorship panel to me. shut up. Um, <laughs> I think Color of Change is running a program that was specifically targeted towards train. There were funding, and maybe Doris Duke can have uh, Muslim critics. Um, that's interesting you idea. know, that's a good. That, that, that's something to think about. So I do know a few organizations are, but that is very needed. That is very needed. I, I, Color of Change. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point is these programs by organizations that are nonprofit that are creating pipelines, pipeline organizations are so incredibly important. That's what gets, gets things to go through. So I think that creating those is really great. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Hi. Um, I'm a lifestyle editor. Uh, it's a hyper-local publication here in Austin. Nice. Um, and it's really hard to find news that isn't, like commercialized because they don't have the publicists. Um, and obviously like Muslim news and Arab news isn't really commercialized in that way. So I was wondering if you have any tips for staying in touch with the community on that level and maintaining boundaries because it's really hard to tell people I can't write that story, hmm. you know? Watch Al Jazeera. Yeah. Arab news, Middle Eastern eye. Um, there are a lot of Arab public, I mean, it's all over social media. And also organizations like ISF, um, MPAC, uh, these organizations are connected with storytellers, pop pillars. pillars, you know, we're all, these large organizations are connected to the other um, Muslim storytellers, that's our storyteller only, but they're fashion ones, I mean, there's so many fashion Muslim blogs, like there's, there's so many different areas where you can find um, a specific minority or ethnic group that are telling human interest stories, which are lifestyle stories. Mm -hmm. And when you say, um, I can't tell that story, what do you mean by that? Well, because I don't write for, like, a political newspaper. Oh, got you. So a lot of people are like, I have this friend who lives here, and she really needs money, and here's a fundraiser. And I'm like, I, can't, I don't do that for anybody. You're I'm like, so sorry. Hey, does she make art? Right. <laughs> well, like, literally, what... sometimes I do ask that. Um, yeah, but I mean. most of the time, no. Yeah, I mean, the only other way that you do is, like, if you have someone in a part of the magazine that tells that story, you can connect them to that. I think that's mm -hmm. the only way is, like, again, pipelining and advocacy for other people. Um, I think that's the only way. Like, I would love to tell that story, but um, if you have a human interest story that can uplift, like, Muslim joy or, you know, black joy, that's what I really want to tell. Yeah. So I think Thank we're you. just at time, so maybe if the last two folks could just ask your questions together, and at least we could know what your questions are, um, and then may, try to answer them. So oh. go for it. And then, As and then As Assalamu alaikum. My, my name is Brother Haling Muhammad. Uh, my wife is Sister Amina Bakir. She is one of the panelists and also... Uh, a storyteller herself. Um, I want to, the question I had was, uh, we know Hollywood is like a two-headed monster. Um, it, uh, it is controlled by one demographic group, but it's created for another de demographic group. Um, so you have to be careful what you say about one demographic group, but as long as you dance and cater to the other demographic group. Uh, my question is, how do you get more like the sister of mine was saying, uh, like big Sony, the dis big distributors, to uh, pick up um, outside of those demographic groups a movie or take interest without catering to particular demographic groups without picking up a phone call and say, hey, I got to know somebody, know somebody. How do, you get, how do we get those big di distributors to take interest in groups outside of those two demographic groups without catering? How do we do that? And let's get, the, let's get the last question, then we'll give each person a last word to respond. So I'll be really quick. Uh, Brother Ahmed, going back to a decade ago when you made that post uh, coming out of Tel Aviv, do you regret that moment? Do you ever envision what your career would be if you would have stayed silent? And how does that make you feel? You and could then, have played Oppenheimer. <laughs> yeah, I, um, and, then, and then second, uh, when, you, when you go back to Pakistan and you see the tremendous talent that exists there, is there anything that you think um, um, American Muslims can do to help foster and, uh, and allow the imagination to flourish there? 
Thank you. Two rich questions, maybe last word from each I'll, panel. I'll, I'll make this quick. To answer your question really quickly, no, I do not regret that decision I made. I would do it again in a hot second. It, it felt right at the time. Um, I'm, you know, I was in Palestine last August at the, the annual Palestine Comedy Festival. Same shit. Um, I did a post, got kicked off of Twitter. I don't give two shits. Um, and to answer your question about Hollywood, Hollywood sees one color, and that's green. Money. So it doesn't matter what race, color, religion. If they know they can profit off of you and on you, then they're going to buy you. They're going to they're gonna bring you in. So, you know, when I start making millions of dollars, trust me, I'll be right back in that circle, getting invited to the parties, walking the red carpet. Amen. Um, yes, so, I mean, I think the same thing as I, the people in the room, right? The only reason why I have Sony is because it was an Arab Muslim that wanted our story to be told. And so we need more people like that. Anybody that helped me to this point has been a woman of color in the industry. And so I really believe we just have to have more people in that um, position as well. I also really want to say I'm wearing a shirt um, for in honor of the uh, journalists that were killed in Palestine mm -hmm. um, for the press for the Palestine. And we're all going to be working, keeping your voice very hard, um, loud for the liberation of the Palestinian people. Thank you. Jerem, you want to close this out? Oh, what was the first? Um, you know, I, I do not think it's just money. Um, I do think that there's definitely isms. Uh, we cannot ignore, like even when, you know, like for example, we talk about this when female directed films, they're like, oh, that was just a one case scenario. <laughs> you know, it doesn't, because they will say, oh, women, female directed films don't make money. Then a stats report will be published that no, they do, but they're like, oh, well, that was just a one case scenario. So there's isms, but I will throw it back to the audiences. Uh, I think when the distributors do see audiences reacting to content, that can do a needle shift. So I think what's in your power, and this is gonna tie into the gentleman's second question, you do, you, you do what's in your power, but do it seriously. When you watch a film that you like, that is small, tweet about it, talk about it, tell a friend to go see it, vote with your money. If you can't go to the cinema, buy a ticket. I keep saying when you buy online or a ticket, that's a vote. It's like democracy. Mm. When they see the collection, they will say, oh, yeah, it made money, right? It doesn't matter. So don't always be like, a filmmaker has already put their blood, sweat, and tears. It's okay. Pay $15. Guys, we pay, like, so much money for other things. For some reason, we're so stuck that content should be free. That's a whole other panel. Um, the other conversation, uh, sir, the Pakistan conversation, um, I think you got to fund these people, man. There's no infrastructure in Pakistan fund these people. I'm, I'm doing whatever I can. I think on the grassroots we are. But like if you find these artists, fund them. And if you see our films, again, watch them, donate to them, celebrate them, share them so we can make more movies. And if we want to see Vakri, where do we go tomorrow? So Vakri is Alamo Lamar <laughs> 6, 7.15 uh, p.m. And then Violet Crown, inshallah, on the 14th at 2.15 and 2.45 p.m. And hopefully like an online streaming platform, do not, do not pirate my movie. <laughs> And with that, please join me in thanking our panelists.